my name is Ashley Lukens, and uh, I am the director of the Hawaii Center for Food Safety. Um, first and foremost, I just really want to thank all you guys for being here. I know it's, I like to call it a school night, but I know everybody's got to get up early and go to work tomorrow, so I really appreciate your time. Um, the structure, it takes me about 45 minutes to do the presentation, and then we're going to open it up for a question and answer. If any of you guys have questions about the report or anything that we've presented. Um, so just going to ask everybody to hold their questions until the end of the presentation. Um, the bathrooms, everybody probably knows this space better than I do. The bathrooms are in the back. We have cookies and tea up here. Uh, okay, so I'm going to get started. Um, today I am going to walk you through the key findings from a report that our organization published in May of this year. Um, but before I present the report, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. And I've been joking a little bit that the real reason why we're traveling across the state is so that I can share my amazing headshot with you guys, and you can stare at it for the next 10 minutes. Um, you guys, do you think we could keep it down a little bit? Um, if we run out of chairs, too, there's room up here on the floor, and um, just be mindful of Kupuna, who might need a seat if we have cakey and seats. Um, there's some open seats up here, I think right there, up in the front. Um, so me, who am I? Uh, again, my name's Ashley Lukens. I'm the director of the Hawaii Center for Food Safety. And the Center for Food Safety is a national advocacy organization. Um, I oftentimes explain to people that we're like the Sierra Club for food. We have 750,000 members nationwide. Um, and we have about 10,000 members here in Hawaii. Uh, originally, I'm from Houston, Texas. I um, spent most of my childhood growing up in the woods in a small town outside of Houston called Montgomery. And I moved to Hawaii in 2006 uh, to attend the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, and during the time at UH Manoa, I started um, researching food and the power that food has in our lives. Um, I really saw that food was a way that people were coming together to organize, to sort of change the world around them. Um, people were using food to reconnect with their culture. People were using food to sort of re-empower themselves in the context of their homes. In the process of doing my doctorate, I, I owned a small business in Manoa um, where we worked with mothers on you know, teaching them about easy ways to cook baby food and, you know, food-based healing. Um, and again, it was just, food was this really powerful and positive part of people's lives. Um, through my time at uh, UH, I also started to what I call recreationally lobby at the Hawaii State Legislature. And I was largely working on... Um, policies that would increase local food production and increase access to local food. So it was really important to me that um, the state really start to support food farmers, um, agriculture that could feed Hawaii's people. We import upwards of 80% of our food in the state, and so we wanted to f see ways that the government could um, play a more positive role in supporting a local food system. And as I started lobbying at the legislature, um, or about maybe two years in, the Center for Food Safety approached me about um, opening their first office here in Hawaii. Um, the Center for Food Safety has worked in our state for about 15 years, but they didn't have a sort of solid and sustained presence. And originally when I was approached about taking the job as the director, 
my first instinct was no. Um, I knew that the Center for Food Safety was deeply embroiled in the debate around GMOs. I didn't have a lot of, um, a lot of knowledge or experience in the debate, but I knew that it was really divisive. I knew that it was dividing people, and I wanted to work on things that brought us together. Um, I felt like there's so much that we can all agree on, um, and I, that's what I wanted to work on. But in the process of sort of considering whether or not to take the job, I had the opportunity to go to the island of Kauai, um, where I met a mother who's my age. Um, her name's Malia Chun. And she lives on Hawaiian homesteads in Keikaha. And um, Malia shares a fence line with um, a large multinational agrochemical company, Syngenta. And every day, Malia wonders what pesticides are being sprayed alongside of her house. Uh, Malia also is considering sending her child to Waimea Canyon Middle School a school that many people in the community of Waimea feel has been evacuated because of pesticide drift. I know that there's controversy around this, but I thought to myself, you know, what would I do if I was a mom and I was sending my child to a school that shared a fence line with an agrochemical operation that was using pesticides that I didn't know about? And I thought that maybe I needed to learn more about what was going on here in the state of Hawaii so that I could understand why so many people were starting to organize on this issue. Um, this pesticide report is a part of my journey to learn about what was going on in the state of Hawaii. Um, I know that a lot of people want to know where we got the data from this report. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about Where's the data? So we pulled on three pools of data. There is no primary research in this report, which means we didn't go around and sample air or do health surveys. Um, we really looked at the data that was readily available through government sources and from peer-reviewed medical journals. So we're looking at studies that doctors and scientists have done. And then we're also looking at government data. So the first set of data that we rely on is just state of Hawaii economic data on what is the shape and the footprint of the seed industry in our state. Um, the second is data that we have for the only the island of Kauai. Only the island of Kauai currently has data on restricted use pesticide applications. So we know we have a snapshot of what the pesticide practices of GE uh, seed corn are because of the data we have from Kauai. But this data is not representative of the seed industry on Oahu, Molokai, or Maui. Um, and you know, to the extent that there are, Monsanto is not on Kauai, None of this data represents their pesticide use because they're currently not required to report it. Uh, we also look at a source of data that's reported to the USDA. So when a company decides to engage in the genetic engineering of a new seed variety, they need to register that with the USDA. Um, and that process of registration is for a field test, basically to test that new crop. So we really dug into the field test data for the state of Hawaii. And then the final set of data that we rely on for this report is medical literature. Um, when I first got this job, I spent probably the first three months touring around and speaking with people on both sides of the issue, really trying to get a sense of where everybody stood, were there things that we agreed on, were there common sense policies that we could pursue in collaboration. Um, and in the process, I realized that although I was very, I was very curious about how, what role pesticides played um, in agriculture in Hawaii, um, I didn't really, there was no doctors sort of front and center participating in the debate. And the debate had kind of been framed as sort of families versus farmers. 
Um, and any attempt to regulate the industry was seen as anti-farmer. But farmers are not trained to understand the toxicological impacts of pesticides, how pesticides might impact the, the, the development of a child's brain. So I wanted to talk to doctors. I wanted to read the medical literature because if doctors were able to explain what was going on, I thought those doctors may, might be able to help us understand how better to regulate the industry as it currently stands. So that's the sort of data that we pull from. Um, so that's enough of my headshot. So we're going to walk through the key findings of our report. We do have copies of the report online. Um, I like to tell everybody Papa Bear is a 100-page report that we only published online. Um, we have a 40-page abridged version of which we had some copies. I think they've all been distributed. Um, then we have an eight-pager, which I call Baby Bear. And then we have a two-pager that summarizes the key findings. But I'm going to kind of walk you through the data. And again, if you guys have questions about the data, please feel free. We're going to have a Q&A after. Um, so what is the seed industry in our state? Is it new? Is it old? We've heard, you know, that it has roots in our state since the 1950s. Actually, here on Molokai is, when the seed, is where the seed industry began. Um, but the seed industry has sort of rapidly started to expand starting in the early 1980s. In fact, it's grown over 10 times since 1982. Um, while the land that we use to grow fruits and vegetables has declined by more than 50%. So we really understand this to be an expanding industry with an expanding footprint in our island. Currently, the seed industry occupies about 25,000 acres. Um, this data is, you know, I think the seed industry has been shifting and moving its footprint. It's been growing on Oahu. Um, so this might not be, this is the most current numbers we have. Um, compare this to the amount of land that we grow, use to grow fruits and vegetables, and it's about double. So about double the amount of land in Hawaii it is used to grow um, seeds versus fruits and vegetables. Um, why? Why is the seed industry expanding? Well, we'll talk a little bit about why Hawaii has an advantage in growing um, and testing GE seeds, but um, we do know that the state of Hawaii has actually actively supported this industry. In fact, they directly lease about 6,000 acres um, of state subsidized land to the seed industry. Um, how many people? Well, currently the seed industry employs about 1,400 workers, many of whom live here on the island of Molokai. Um, but this represents only about 0.23% of jobs in the state. So it's, a, it's an agricultural industry, again, that's occupying more and more of our land, but it's not incredibly labor intensive. So what are we doing? Um, for me, this was a really important question um, because I had really heard about the papaya, I had heard about sort of what I call niche applications of genetic engineering. Um, and although there are niche applications happening here, the, the growing and propagation of papaya, the vast majority of land that goes to GE seed production is for field testing. In fact, Hawaii has hosted more field tests for genetically engineered seeds than any other state in the nation. Um, to give you some perspective, in California, there were 172 field tests. In Hawaii, there were 1,141 field tests. So you're talking about like an incredibly, almost six times the number of field tests here in our state um, on a significantly smaller amount of agricultural land compared to California, an agricultural land that's nested in and among our communities where we live, where we send our kids to school. Um, so what is a field test site? A field test site is a little different than, you know, a, a plot of land where you're growing corn, for example, just for sale, sweet corn you might buy in the grocery store. A field test site is a part of the process that a company that's genetically engineering a seed needs to go through 
to demonstrate um, the effectiveness of the technology, the effectiveness of genetic engineering, but also the impacts that that technology might have on the surrounding environment. So when folks say that um, what's happening here in Hawaii is partially experimental in nature, it's because it's again a part of the deregulatory process. The corn that is grown here in our state under a field test permit is not able to be sold on the market. Farmers cannot buy these seeds directly. In fact, they're waiting for deregulation from the USDA. So what are they field testing? Again, remember I had in my mind, is it the papaya? Is this the lettuce? Um, no, the vast majority of crops that are being field tested are corn and soy, so commodity crops. Um, and these crops largely, when deregulated and enter, entered into our food supply, enter in the form of fuel, feed, animal feed, and then highly uh, processed corn and soy, high fructose corn syrup, et cetera. So this is, we're largely testing commodity crops. You know, you, when you look for field tests for banana, papaya, lettuce, they, they, they show up maybe once a year, if that. Um, so what? What are they genetically engineering corn and soy for? What is the phenotype that they're putting into these plant varieties? Um, if you go through the ISB, Information for Systems of Biotechnology data, and you look at the field test permits, the vast majority of the permits are for increased herbicide resistance in corn and soy. So. What we have here in our state largely is the testing and development of new genetically engineered varieties of corn and soy that are being genetically engineered to increase their resistance to herbicides. Um, so why was this important to me? Why did this help me uh, sort of want to learn more about the industry? Well, a lot of times the industry will say that the crops that we're genetically engineering are are going to be more climate resistant. They're going to be more nutritious. They're going to be more drought resistant. And, and we do use genetic engineering to produce those crop varieties. But that is not the kind of genetic engineering that's happening here in Hawaii. The kind of genetic engineering here that is happening, if you look at the field test data, is for increased herbicide resistance. So, then, so the question then for me is, if you're genetically engineering corn and soy, to increase a plant's resistance to herbicides, well then, what are the pesticide practices associated with that field testing? Um, and from here, this is when we really turn to the Kauai data. Now, for those of you who have sort of tuned into the media, you know that two years ago, Kauai passed a landmark piece of legislation um, that was kind of billed in the media as anti-GMO. But that's not actually what the community was seeking when they fought for that piece of legislation. What they sought was disclosure. They wanted information on the pesticides that were being used in and around their homes and schools. And they wanted the companies to observe buffer zones, to agree not to spray those pesticides around homes, schools, hospitals, and waterways. So because of those, the effort of that community, we have access to data on spraying. Right now it's a voluntary program called the Good Neighbor Program, but it gives us a sense of, well, okay, it, are pesticides an issue? Are they being sprayed? In what amount? You know? Um, so the first thing I learned when I looked at the Good Neighbor Program data is that pesticides are being sprayed year round on our islands. Um, you compare this to other states that also have a high volume of field test sites, Nebraska, Illinois, Iowa. In those communities, they get a winter respite. There's a relatively short growing season. Um, but in our state, we have pesticides being sprayed all year round. Um, and you actually have the highest volumes of pesticide use during our winter, um, which tends to be our rainiest and our windiest months. And the reason why I bring up the weather is because this is obviously when pesticides are prone to drift. 
Um, and in fact, al again, although the industry and the Department of Agriculture have said that the school evacuations in Waimea happened because of stinkweed, um, you'll see that both of those evacuations happened during these high volume spray months. Okay, so year round pesticide applications. Um, the other thing that we learned when we really dug into the Good Neighbor Program data is that there are certain pesticides with a high volume of medical and scientific literature on their impact. And I'm going to focus on three. One is the chemical atrazine. The next is Paraquat. Actually, over the past 30 years, Paraquat has been banned off and on in the United States. Um, and then we're also going to look at a chemical called chlorpyrifos which is a part of a class of insecticides called organophosphates. Um, and there's a lot of literature on the impact of exposure to organophosphates in workers and children. So this is sort of the, the pesticides that we follow. Um, but through the, through the Good Neighbor program, we learned that there's, again, um, a high volume of restricted use pesticides, again, being applied year round. Well, what is a restricted use pesticide? Again, we're not in any way saying that just that we don't want general use pesticide data. Um, for example, um, the chemical glyphosate or Roundup was just declared by the World Health Organization as a probable carcinogen. So we're not saying that general use pesticides are safe, but restricted use pesticides are already designated by the EPA as toxic and hazardous. So the EPA has already said that these are chemicals that deserve greater regulation and greater care when being applied. In the state of Hawaii, in order to spray a restricted use pesticide, you need to get a permit. Um, and in fact, you know, through the, the, the course of us presenting this pesticide report across the state, in, including with the Department of Agriculture, they will say that in order to get, you get a permit for five years to spray a restricted use pesticide, and the Department of Agriculture will inspect the holder of a permit to apply restricted use pesticides once in the course of five years. So it's already regulated and, observe, and sort of monitored by the Department of Ag. I think what people are asking is, is it enough? Is it sufficient? Um, so what if they're spraying high volume of restricted use pesticides year round? Well, how often, how frequently, in what combination? That was the next question. Again, zooming back into Kauai, the community in Kauai actually um, won a class action lawsuit against Pioneer DuPont um, because of the negative impact that their agricultural practices had on their property values. But in the course of that lawsuit, we got access for the first time to that company's spray data. So again, it's been very difficult to figure out if the pesticides that are being sprayed are dangerous, how often, but we do have this one snapshot from Pioneer DuPont. Um, and in their spray records, we found that the company used 90 different pesticide formulations that included 65 different active ingredients. That's not necessarily in one formulation, but across those formulations. Well, why is that important? The EPA only tests the safety of a chemical sprayed once at a time. So a chemical is deregulated by testing that active ingredient. The EPA does not test combinations. But we know by looking at the spray data that there are sort of complex formulations being sprayed. Um, <clears throat> what else did we learn? We also learned that the companies spray often. They spray two out of every three days um, on sort of cultivated land, and they spray up to 16 times a day. So again, you're talking about complex formulations of pesticides being sprayed potentially frequently, multiple times a day. Again, so why? Why? Are, why are the pesticide practices of these companies particularly concerning to the community? Well, in some ways, it's a part of the business model. It's a part of the field testing process. The same companies that own and genetically engineer these seeds um, also make money off of the herbicides that they're genetically engineering these seeds to be resistant to. 
And the reason why I bring this up is because it's a part of a business model. It's a part of the new frontier of industrial agriculture where companies need to make money by selling certain products. And the seeds have become the delivery system for the products that they sell. Um, and in fact, if you look at the sales of herbicides and the application of herbicides since the introduction of genetically engineered seeds, herbicide tolerant corn, soy, and cotton, you'll see that those crops have actually increased herbicide use by over 500 million pounds nationally. So again, for me, this was important because we do hear from the industry that the technology of genetic engineering will actually reduce pesticide spraying. But when you look at the data, that's not the case. You're actually seeing an increase in herbicide use. So why does this matter? Again, for me, I flash back to that moment when I'm thinking about Malia, a mom my age. And I realize that it's not just Malia that's wondering whether or not her children are safe from potential pesticide exposure. In fact, there are 27 schools within the state of Hawaii that are located within one mile of a GE field test site. Um, and in fact, when you dig in and you meet with the community members that live in, or in and around these fields, what you find is that many residents including children, are complaining about the impact of pesticide drift on their health and well-being. So for me, this was a really critical moment in my sort of journey to engage on this issue. Because I think for a lot of us, when we talked about genetic engineering, there was a lot of debate about the labeling of GMOs. And I felt like there were a lot of things that I could do as a mom to decide whether or not that, that was a technology or a product I wanted in my home. You can download an app. You can uh, buy organic. But there is absolutely nothing that an individual can do to stop pesticides from drifting. Only the government can appropriately regulate industry and protect the health and well-being of people that are cohabiting. Um, with a growing agricultural industry in our state. So the next thing we did, if we know that there are high volumes of restricted use pesticides being sprayed in an industry that is expanding across our state and that is currently not regulated in terms of where it can apply pesticides, um, we wanted to look at the medical literature on pesticide exposure to determine whether or not people should be concerned about the potential impact of pesticide drift. We looked at 150 different medical studies, many of, which, many of which were meta studies, so they're studies of studies, right? They might look at all the studies on a particular class of chemicals like organophosphates. And for me, this was a really important moment in my journey sort of engaging on this issue because the medical literature is unequivocal. It absolutely says that the chemicals that are being applied here in, in Hawaii are dangerous and that we need to prevent exposure, particularly to three classes of the population that have known demonstrated health impacts from regular pesticide exposure. Um, the first class is pregnant women. Now think about all the things we do when we're pregnant to protect the development of a baby inside of our bodies. You know, we don't eat tuna, we don't eat unpasteurized cheese, we don't drink alcohol, we don't smoke cigarettes, and that's because the development of a growing baby is particularly vulnerable to chemical exposure. And so we need to, when you're pregnant, you take extra steps to make sure that the baby growing inside of you is safe. Um, Women who are exposed to pesticides when pregnant, first and foremost, have bad birth outcomes. You see spontaneous abortion, you see preterm birth. But where you see the most impact is in the impact on the fetus or the child that is born. 
We, you see reduce, re increased numbers of autism, ADHD, de developmental delays. Again, the medical literature is clear on this. In fact, there's a study um, called the CHARGE study out of UC Davis. It followed a core cohort of hundreds of children for 14 years. And it showed that children who had been exposed to organophosphates while their mothers were pregnant were seven times more likely to have learning and developmental delays. Uh, next, we see children who are exposed to pesticides um, have higher rates of brain cancer, leukemia. Again, you see that same class of impact, the impact on a child's ability to learn, to engage socially, higher rates of asthma. And then finally, pesticides are most dangerous to the people who apply them. Farm workers have higher rates of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. They have higher rates of depression. They have higher rates of cancer. Um, and so what we need there is then to examine how we protect sort of those who apply the pesticides and those who live in around and might face exposure. Um, we also, and we're going to spend the next year really uh, sort of digging into this, identified at least six native species that share habitat with companies that are, engaged, that are using high volumes of restricted use pesticides. And so we do also know that these, this industry potentially has an impact on Hawaii's biodiversity. Um, so then the final question is, are we protected? If the medical literature is clear, that pesticides are dangerous to the developing brain, to the developing fetus, to the workers who apply it. Well, what are the measures of protection? And I'm going to talk here not just about the EPA and how the EPA regulates pesticides, but since doing this um, presentation across the state, we've really had the opportunity to also learn from the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Health about how they regulate pesticides and how they protect people from pesticide impacts. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how pesticides are regulated. Um, first and foremost, um, the EPA only tests active ingredients. So safety studies sort of submitted to the EPA that sort of allow the EPA to deregulate a pesticide only look at the impact of that ac active ingredient. The EPA does not test combinations. Um, secondly, the EPA has a long history of allowing pesticides on the market and then pulling them off after they've found an impact. Um, this is because in the United States, we follow a risk-benefit model. So we need to prove that a pesticide is dangerous before it's taken off the market. But Hawaii actually has a really long history of pesticide contamination. Um, many people remember the heptachlor contamination of the milk supply. Heptachlor was sprayed on pineapple tops, then fed to cows, and then negatively impacted the children who drank the milk of those cows. A lot of us remember DDT. Um, this was a pesticide that was deregulated by the EPA. Folks were allowed to use it, and then we learned the absolutely devastating impact that DDT had on fish and bird species. Um, the EPA also has a bifurcated or two-part regulatory regime for some chemicals. Um, chlorpyrifos, for example, remember that was that organophosphate that we saw was sprayed regularly um, on the island of Kauai, is actually banned in home use. So that means that my daughter, who lives in urban Honolulu, is protected by the EPA from a chemical that your children are not protected from because you're allowed to use chlorpyrifos in rural communities. So the EPA has already said that chemicals like chlorpyrifos are dangerous. They should not come into contact with children. And they've done that by banning it in urban use, but it is allowed in rural communities. Um, the other thing that we've learned, and, and this should actually say acute versus chronic exposure. So when we've been talking with the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Health, one of the things that the department will say is that, you know, when you look at school evacuations, when you look at people calling and reporting because of pesticide drift, you just don't really see the reports. People aren't complaining. 
People aren't calling the DOA, people aren't calling the Department of Health complaining about pesticide drift. And that's that type of exposure, the type of exposure where, where it might drift into your home and you call the Department of Health, is called acute. And we know that acute exposure is dangerous. But what the medical literature really looks like, uh, looks at is chronic exposure. That's low level, daily, exposure to chemicals. In fact, that study that I told you about, the CHARGE study, looked at the impact of these pesticides on children who lived in the homes of ag workers. So the kids weren't necessarily breathing the air with pesticides. The, the pesticides were coming off of their parents' clothing. And still, even through that form of exposure, you see demonstrated health impact. So daily low-level exposure is difficult to report. Right? It's the level of exposure that you can't smell. It might not make you feel dizzy, um, but it nevertheless has an impact, particularly when children breathe it in, when they get it on their fingers and they put it on their mouth. So there's a difference. And the, right now, the only way to detect chronic exposure is through monitoring. Right? Do you install air monitors around homes and schools? You do surface testing. Um, you do water sampling. And right now, this Hawaii has no regular monitoring regime for pesticides. They've done a one-time stream study where they looked for pesticides in 27 different streams. Um, and they've done random sampling at certain schools, but they do no regular monitoring. And that's really the only way that we can figure out if we are exposed chronically to, to pesticides that are known to be dangerous. Um, uh, when we were meeting with doctors on this report and sharing it, there's currently no trained toxicologist in the state of Hawaii who looks at this question. So we sort of lack the medical expertise to kind of help us as a community answer this. Um, but what we learned was that actually the American Academy of Pediatrics has already issued a policy statement on this. So all the doctors in the US came together and they said, pesticides are dangerous, particularly to children. And we need to take extra measures to ensure that our children aren't exposed to these chemicals. And they recommended things like no spray buffer zones, what the community on Kauai fought for. They said, you know, that's the logic of pediatrics, remember? You don't take your kid to the doctor to get vaccinated after they've been exposed to measles. You do it before, right? Because you're preventing the potential impact of a threat that is going to be worse for children. So the so doctor said, you know, we need to take preventative measures to ensure that our children are not exposed to chemicals that are known to be harmful to them. Um, at this point, you know, having sort of felt, you know, pretty clear and confident that the medical literature suggested that we need to regulate these practices. And having examined how the practices are regulated in Hawaii, feeling that it wasn't appropriately regulated, I then had to really turn back to my community um, who's been organizing and on this issue. Um, and I thought about a phrase, lucky we live Hawaii. Now, this is a hashtag that young people use on the internet a lot. And if you search the hashtag, what you get is pictures like this. Pictures of Hawaii's be beaches and mountains, its native species. You know, all the things about Hawaii that I think make us feel incredibly lucky to live in this place. Um, what you don't see is pictures like this. You know, beaches where they're so crowded with tourists that local people can't even sort of experience that resource anymore. If you search the hashtag, you don't see pictures like this. Um, this is the bulldozing of uh, Oahu's prime agricultural land to make room for houses that many local people can't afford. Um, if you search the hashtag, you don't see this. I mean, the growing amount of traffic that we face across the state is not something that makes us feel lucky to live in Hawaii. I 
started to realize that, you know, the, the idea of Lucky We Live Hawaii actually speaks to, I think, a really powerful cultural value in our state, and that's of kuleana. Right? We feel lucky to live in Hawaii. Um, and from that sort of sense of gratitude comes a sense of responsibility. If you feel lucky to live in a place, then you have a responsibility to protect that place. And responsibility necessarily seeks opportunity. Right? Responsibility is not passive, it's active. You actively take measures to protect what you love. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear this, but in 2011, I was on the North Shore of Oahu at a Surfrider um, John Kelly Awards event. And that little girl dancing is my daughter. Um, she's three years old. She got up in front of Jack Johnson, who was, a, who was performing, and she did a dance in front of 500 people. Um, and partially, I just really wanted to show this adorable video of my daughter as a little bit of a break. Um, but it was at that event that I learned about a woman named Cora Sanchez. Cora was being honored at that event. And Cora has been a longtime community activist on Oahu. In fact, she helped establish the Pupukea Waimea Marine Life Conservation District. Um, she helped found the Surfrider Foundation on Oahu. Um, she established the Friends of Sharks Cove. I realized when I was thinking about Cora on the North Shore, the North Shore is definitely a place in Hawaii, on the island of Oahu, where people feel that sort of feeling of gratitude. I feel lucky to live here. Um, I realized that Cora was a, actually a part of a long tradition of people in our state who have stood up and fought for access to resources, who have fought for, who have fought to preserve the integrity of their communities. They, they fought to protect the Hawaii where they feel lucky to live. Um, and I realized that, you know, for me, many of the people organizing on this issue are expressing that sense of kuleana. They feel lucky to live in Hawaii and they feel that sort of this increased pesticide use is threatening a place where they feel lucky to live. And I think it's also about justice. Um, it is, again, only the government who can protect our children from exposure to pesticides. Only the government. There is no individual action that any of you can take to ensure that your children are potentially safe from pesticide drift. And so that's why people are turning to the government to ask them to take common sense steps to ensure, again, the safety of their families. At CFS, we've been really working on two legislative issues. One is the concept of buffer zones. We want to ensure that some of the most toxic pesticides are not sprayed around our homes, our hospitals, and our schools. And we've also been working on disclosure. We don't have access to the spray data for companies on each of these islands. Um, and so we need that information. You know, if we find out that certain companies are not applying high volumes of restricted use pesticides on a regular basis, that's really important information that we need and that all community members should have. Um, we're also asking people to engage in the process themselves. We need allies on this issue in office and outside of office. Um, we're asking people to educate their community. And again, I really want to mahalo all of you for coming out here. Um, I understand that people in this room sit on both sides of the debate. But we have to have a question. We have to start have a conversation about the data that's out there. We have to really dig into it. We need to read the medical studies together and determine what really are the risks and what are not, and what are the policies that we can pursue that can protect us without necessarily impacting people's jobs. And then the other thing that we're really asking people to do is engage youth in the conversation. Um, I've been asked to present the data or the findings of our pesticide report at certain schools. And when we, I was 
at a middle school recently, and, and the middle schoolers asked, you know, well, I, I don't understand. How is it possible that, the, that these chemicals can be sprayed near our schools? How is it possible? And I said, well, you know, what kind of government? I mean, let's, let's roll back. What kind of, we live in the United States. What kind of government do we have? And at least 30 kids shouted out, a bad one. Um, I think that's because kids don't feel like they have a voice in this conversation. And they don't feel like their elected officials are really listening to what they want for their future. But the fact of the matter is that it is our children that are going to inherit the world that we're creating. And I think they should have a voice in determining sort of what comes next. Um, you can find our full pesticide report on our website, hawaiicfs.org. Um, we also have a variety of different um, sort of tools on the website where you can explore different parts of the data. I would really encourage you guys, if you take a look at the abridged version, um, we do summarize the health impacts sort of in a longer form. It's very easy to read, um, but it's on page 22. And we start by examining um, the medical literature on pesticide exposure, not just to children, but those who work with pesticides in their daily lives. Um, and I wanted to close with a quote by Arundhati Roy. And a lot of times I give this presentation to people who don't feel like they should participate in the sort of governmental process. And they think, you know, I'm not interested in what the government's doing. Uh, you know, I'm just going to keep my head down. Um, and I think the government's already protecting me, so I'm not going to sort of participate further. Um, and Arundhati Roy writes, it's important to remember that our freedoms, such as they are, were never given to us by any government. They have been wrested by us. If we do not test them from time to time, they atrophy. If we do not guard them constantly, they will be taken away from us. If we do not demand more and more, we will be left with less and less. Um, my sense is that this movement is about demanding more and more from our government, that they appropriately regulate a new industry in our state to ensure the long-term health and well-being, not just of our islands and our ecosystems, but the future generations that are going to be taking care of those islands. So with that, mahalo. Great. So we have plenty of time for question and answer. Um, I'm not sure, I think we only have one mic, so um, if folks have questions, they can maybe come up and ask the question in the mic, or I can repeat it. Um, anybody, questions? Yeah. So, so if I was the IRS, how am I supposed to tax someone who doesn't report income, right? So. This is just an analogy into my question where, um, so, and this is also, in connect, you can connect this with the bill that you were, I'm referring to with the buffer zone. So does that take into consideration and with your with their study also those who, pesticide users who do not report? So for example, like landscapers, you know, like pest control um, companies. So if, because if it's not, if, if these companies don't report it, we're still exposed to that. We use that in our home. We buy spray from, from Friendly, right? We buy roach spray. We buy termite spray. So how do you account that with your pesticide report as well as the legislative bills that you are preparing? Yeah, I think this is a really great question. Um, I get asked this a lot, right? I mean, are we as an organization and as a movement concerned about other um, sectors of the industry and of our communities that use pesticides? The short answer is absolutely, yes. We're concerned about all pesticide exposure. And again, remember at the beginning of the uh, presentation, I said, you know, we're o we only have access to restricted use pesticide data, but this does not mean that we're not concerned about general use pesticides as well, particularly chemicals like Roundup, which have are now de uh, designated by the World Health Organization as a probable carcinogen. So yes, 
We're absolutely concerned about pesticides, our children's exposure to those pesticides in their everyday life. Um, but this is also a question about regulatory rollout, how policies, how protections happen. And oftentimes, what the government will decide to do is regulate the largest class first. So for example, the buffer zones and disclosure legislation did not pinpoint any sort of industry specifically. It said anybody purchasing over and above five pounds or 15 gallons of a restricted use pesticide needs to report it. So regardless of the entity, if you're purchasing that high volume, you should have to tell us when you're spraying it and where, and you can't do it around homes and schools. Um, the second question that people ask is, well, what about you know, termite companies? They use more restricted use pesticides than the GE seed industry. And to that, I often say, well, you know, think about what happens when your neighbor's house undergoes a, a, a termite treatment. You cover that house with a big red and white tent. Everybody clears out for 24 hours. If that's what companies want to do when they decide to spray restricted use pesticides, I might be okay with that. Because um, at least we would know when they're being applied and we could make a decision about whether or not we want to be in and around that field. So we already see notification and disclosure happening with pesticide treatments. We don't see that currently now with the industry, with the GE seed industry. And so that, I think that's what people are seeking. They just want notification. They just want disclosure so that they can make decisions and it's only the government that can regulate those entities. Only the government. Thank you for your question. Yes. I know you're centered around the health of us as humans um, with your research. My question is directed directly about the Aina. Um, it's the life in the Aina that actually will sustain us. Do you have research um, available on that? Um, not the biology is us, but the biology and the soil that keeps us living. So the Center for Food Safety has published a variety of reports on sort of uh, the impacts of fungicides, pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers on soil health. Um, and so I could point you to our website on that. We haven't done any soil testing and analysis here in Hawaii. It's something that, again, people want. They want to know how the soil, how the life of the land is being impacted by these practices. But for right now, for this report, we were really looking again at the medical literature because for me, that was a space that wasn't being occupied by the field. So we wanted to see, you know, what have doctors written about pesticide exposure? Because the kinds of regulations that we're seeking right now are primarily health focused. Um, they're to prevent human exposure to ensure long-term human health and safety. Um, so again, generally CFS does look at so soil health and that's on our website, but for this report, we didn't examine soil health. Next question. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a really great question. I, I, I went over this in the beginning of the presentation, but we actually didn't do any primary research and analysis for this report. All we did was aggregate the data that was available and then analyze the medical literature. So 150 different medical studies were referenced in this report, um, but we did not con conduct any studies ourselves. I will say that one of the things that's been coming out of this is that the community is asking for those studies. They're saying, we want monitoring. We want to do a health survey by an independent third-party organization, not CFS, not the industry, potentially the Department of Health. Um, and I think, to, to some extent, yes, health and safety studies are absolutely important, and they're a part of the next step. Um, and I think that the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Health have expressed an interest in doing that. And I think the industry has been supportive thus far, as has CFS. But my attitude is I don't think communities should have to prove that something is dangerous. I think the industry should prove that it's safe. And currently, I don't see the medical literature demonstrating that long-term chronic exposure to 
pesticides is safe for human health and the environment. I don't see that. Instead, the, the medical literature says something very different. And so for me, that is the basis of regulation. And I don't know if I have 14 years for another charge study to happen here in the state of Hawaii. I don't know if we want to wait 14 years to watch children that are growing inside of their mother's stomachs wait to show impact. But the charge study did show, again, seven times more likely for those children to have neurological impacts. For me, that's enough. That's enough to say we should regulate these chemicals. And in fact, the EPA is already doing that. They've already said, let's not have chemicals like chlorpyrifos sprayed in homes and in urban areas. In fact, they've recently announced that they're considering banning chlorpyrifos. So we already see incentive at the government level to regulate these chemicals. And I think what our work is trying to do is to ensure that those regulations are being enforced in place here in Hawaii, given the nature of the industry and its footprint and proximity to our homes and our schools. Yes, sir. I just have a request for the record. You probably have all noticed that there's quite a few seed people in here. And I'd like to, show, I'd like to see a show of hands for all the people who don't necessarily agree with what Ashley is trying to say about us. Show of hands. So just for the record, we don't all buy it. All right? My question, if I may, your report focuses four pages on school contamination or school exposure. Why didn't you use the information from the Hawaii Department of Agriculture that states over the last 10 years, nine years, forgive me, there have been 16 cases of school contamination with pesticides, none of which, zero of which, were associated with the seed industry. Did you look at that report? And why didn't you use it in your report? Thank you. Um, first and foremost, I am absolutely aware of um, the audience that I'm presenting to. Um, and I thank you for coming here. I understand that this is not an easy conversation, particularly for you. Um, and so I, I know the room I'm in. I know my place. That does not mean that I don't think that the research and the analysis that we did isn't important to this community. And thank you for listening respectfully and letting me share the findings of our report. Um, I am aware, in fact, I presented the report in Waimea and we had somebody um, actually bring the Department of Agriculture memo. And the Department of Agriculture again did an analysis of school evacuations and determined that no evacuation was due to the GE seed industry. Now there's a couple things. One, remember that the basis of our report was not acute exposure. Those incidences that might evacuate a school or result in vomiting or passing out, which is, are some of the consequences of acute exposure. And they are the consequences that many community and me members in Waimea feel they, their children experience at the middle, middle, at the middle school. Um, we looked at chronic, low-level exposure. Exposure that's not going to trigger a phone call to the Department of Health or the Department of Ag, but that kind of exposure still has a health impact. And the question then becomes, well, what do we do to prevent or mitigate low-level, chronic, daily exposure? And again, it's, the, the American Academy of Pediatrics has already reviewed that and recommended there are policy solutions to prevent exposure. Um, so again, I, I do know the Department of Agriculture's sort of policy or sort of statement. It actually came out about the same time as our pesticide report. Um, I don't know if the community in Waimea would agree 
that the evacuation of that school wasn't due to the seed industry, but the Department of Agriculture determined that it was stinkweed. So I, I, I understand um, the conclusions of that finding, but that in no way, in no way, um, tells us about whether or not our children are being exposed at low levels on a daily basis. And when we look at the medical literature and they talk about the potential distance where you can find chronic low-level exposure, it's the medical literature that says one mile. It wasn't just a distance that we came out with out of thin air. So they start to see demonstrable impact within one mile of restricted pesticide applications. Um, and that's any, anybody who's using restricted use pesticides, not just the GE seed industry. Um, and that's why the policies that we've been pushing look for any entity that's using a high volume of restricted use pesticides. Can you provide me the reference for that one for the charge study? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Okay, yeah, I, we can do that. In fact, we actually, for everybody's reference, and we only have one copy here, um, we have uh, actually the full text versions of some of the most key medical studies that we cite in the report. Um, back on the table. So if you'd like to take a look at the studies yourself, um, we have them back there. Uh, next question. Yes, ma'am. Aloha, Ashley. Thank you. My name is Dawn. Um, I just heard you just that exchange with Ray, and you did acknowledge that there is a Department of Ag study out and that they determined that it was stinkweed. I'd like to ask, would you be able to include that in your report so that it is fair and balanced, so that people can understand that that isn't, well, what you are alluding to is not necessarily what the Department of Ag is, is saying. So, but I have a, a few things. Um, I know you mentioned that there was only pesticide information for Kauai, and um, so I, I don't know if you're aware and um, as of 2012, Monsanto also provides RUP use for, the, uh, for all of Maui County. So what you said was incorrect. So I'd like you to also be able to um, alter what you were saying, that there also is Maui County. And I don't know if you guys, if anybody is interested, but this packet right here that some of the seed industry people have actually shows the memorandum of understanding with Maui County Mayor, and it shows the actual uses of Monsanto throughout Maui County, and it gives you the pesticides applied per acre. And you refer, and you say that there were about 16 sprays a day, but when you look at the total amount per acre of RUPs that Monsanto has sprayed within Maui County, you're looking at less than a gallon per acre annually. So when you look at, when you say 16 times, you think it's this huge amount, but when you look at the reality of the numbers, it, a lot of it is like eight ounces. And uh, an acre is um, a football field less the two end zones. So if you take a can of soda and you sprinkle it over an acre, that's pretty much what, what we're talking about annually. Um, also, there is a 2013 Department of Ag RUP sales data, which shows that non-ag use is 67% and ag use is 33%, and Monsanto represents 1% of that. So if you can add that, because you did say uh, you have to have a conversation about data out there. So this is data. Also, I just wanted to mention offhand, I know you, you uh, uh, mentioned atrazine, and I just wanted to say, because I was looking at the LD50, which is the toxicity of atrazine today, actually. And uh, it is slightly more toxic than beer. That's it. Um, great. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I think one of the things that the medical literature tells us is that... You, the dose of a pesticide is in no way related to its potential negative impact. A gallon of one pesticide can be far less toxic than a teaspoon of another. So 
the amount, gallon, ounce, et cetera, doesn't necessarily tell us about the toxicity. Um, and so, and I also um, want to uh, acknowledge the memorandum with the mayor of Maui County where Monsanto has committed to releasing its pesticide use data. We did not have access or did not reference that in our report. And I did clarify that the data that we pulled from was only the island of Kauai for our report. You said there wasn't any other available, and it's available on the Maui County website for the entire public from 2012 to 2014. And our 2015 numbers will be coming out. Great. I, I really, I look, and actually the Department of Agriculture has announced that they're going to start a voluntary disclosure program across the state. So I think we're going to get more information that's accessible to the public about pesticide use. And we're looking forward to that because, again, I think the more information that we have, the more we can uh, determine whether or not there are threats posed to our community. And, you know, I applaud the industry and the Department of Agriculture for taking the initiative to start that program. Um, in our experience, though, voluntary programs don't serve um, to regulate bad actors, and so we really want to see the state make that a mandatory program. Oh, we got the 16 evacuations that the guy was talking about. That was chemical evacuations from, from chemicals. Um, so the guy is using the chemicals, but you guys know who make the chemicals. Like, you blame the drug addict, but the drug dealer is the guy. Like, so who make all these chemicals that can cause 16 evacuations? I think that's a good point. I mean, I think, uh, they, Get the deal, not the addict. The companies that manufactured the chemicals that led to um, evacuations in our school are the same companies that we're seeking to regulate with our buffer zones and disclosure rules. So I think the point is that if they're manufacturing the chemicals, that we should have regulation on those chemicals and the companies that produce them. Um, I'm going to have maybe one more question, and then we can all go home. Yes. Hi, Ashley. Thank you for coming. It's nice to see you, and uh, welcome to Molokai. One of the questions that I have is you say that the medical data that you're out there, you've got these 1,500 studies that show these effects, but one, this is a multi-part question. Have you referenced all the studies that you're talking about in the medical, medical data? And the other one is you talk about there are no long-term studies. It's, it's incumbent upon the agricultural companies to prove that it's safe. And there's no long-term studies. But would that be reasonable to expect that we want to have long-term studies that prove electricity is safe, that air travel is safe, that chronic exposure to gasoline and petroleum is safe? So I think the burden of proof comes on those who are making the claims to prove that there actually is a harm. Otherwise, we're out just chasing a bunch of ghosts. Another part to the question is you say that there's not any active monitoring that's going on out there, but in this package that we have, there's a report from the Department of Water Supply for Maui County that shows that they tested all Maui County water sources. And the threshold for glyphosate, the acceptable level threshold for glyphosate is 600 parts per billion. The detection assay that they have can detect down to six parts per billion. And every single water source tested, no detect. So is that a report that's in this package that we have here that you would be willing to include in your report? I think what this community is saying loud and clear by being here is these people live and work in this community. If anyone knows about agriculture, it's this community. If anyone knows about pesticides, it's this community. And if anyone are good stewards of the land, it's the good members of this community that you see out here. So I would welcome you to give a comprehensive view in your report rather than only picking the items that help to confirm your bias and promote the entrepreneurial agenda of the conflict industry. Thank you. I, I think I'm going to take this one last question and then I'm going to be done. Um, so I appreciate that there are more questions in the room, but I'm pow. Um, 
First and foremost, I think um, what I'm hearing from the sort of, oh, because there were many questions in there, is our study comprehensive and do we look at all the monitoring that's happening in the state of Hawaii and do, does our analysis justify, is, is regulation justifiable, right? I mean, should we regulate? Should we regulate the industry? Guys, all we're asking for is disclosure. Tell us what you're spraying on a regular basis, where it's being sprayed. And we're asking for buffer zones. We're asking that these not be sprayed near homes, schools, hospitals, and waterways. I understand that the industry is not interested in those regulations, but I think many people across the state of Hawaii are. And I think it's important that we come together. That is the purpose of democracy, that we kind of have that back and forth and we figure out where we can agree on. And I do think that is what we're seeing... Is the purpose of democracy or the purpose of a constitutional republic, which is what we are? Not a democracy. Not everything at every moment should be regulated by the So I think we need to accurately represent that as well. I think, I, I, again, I, I'm going I'm to shut it down here because I don't, I don't see this going in a good direction, but thank you very much. In all directions. That's why you want to shut it down. There's a lot of people. Yeah, you should take, you should take their questions because you're the doctor. What kind of doctor are you, by the way? I have a PhD in political science. Okay, there you go, exactly. And that means you want to swing this politically for your own political agenda. That's why you're here. You're not here to come talk about uh, you know, um, the people and poison and stuff like that. Otherwise, you would have got one person from the Department of Health. You have a person who knows what they're talking about. You're a political scientist. That's what you just said you are. You're here to swing your own political agenda. Hello, you guys. Thank you.